Hey everybody, welcome back to the Woodworking Wisdom Workshops. My name's Colin Way and today it's part two of our Christmas carousel. So if you watched last week or if you saw part one, we made basically the, the, the bottom tier, the lowest part of, the, of our carousel. Um, we'll run over again some of the, um, the, the, the history behind the carousel. We'll show you some pictures later on. But today is all about making this single tiered carousel. I've got a few things to show you that I promised you from last week as well. So we've got Craig on the cameras and asking questions today. So don't forget, you know how it works. You use that chat function. Ask us all the questions that you can think of. It really helps me as a demonstrator, as a presenter, um, to know that there's people there watching and, and uh, involved in, in what we're doing. So briefly, let's have a recap first, what we're making. So the carousel, the German Christmas pyramid. Um, this is a single tiered version. So we haven't rehearsed this, this camera work. So I'm going to ask Craig in a minute to pull up a few stills. But this is a single tier. So basically what we're looking at here, if we could go to that first picture, Craig, sorry, um, just at the single tier, it's a, a very much a, a, a German tradition. And the, the Christmas pyramids are imaged after... Um, the the lift that brought the ore and the miners up from the mines in the ore mountains of eastern Germany. And uh, so the Christmas pyramid was born. This is a predecessor to the Christmas tree that, that we now bring inside and decorate. But single pyramid um, carousel is the one you're looking at there. And if you have a look, you can see the four candles, no pun intended there, four candles down the bottom lighting the Christmas pyramid. And then the heat that that generates makes the impellers revolve and in turn the little scene holder at the bottom in, in this picture here you can see a little snowman a couple of christmas trees so they're really quite nice now once you've done one of these you're going to want to do another one once you see it start turning with your own um, candle power we can then work up so like i say this is a single tier at the moment if we then move on to what is the three tier version um, now you can see here we've got more candles on the bottom there's eight candles there and you could in include candles on the second tier as well if you wanted to if you needed more power more heat power to generate the movement but then again you can see three tiers on this one three scenes and uh, in this particular one we've got angels at the top we've got the three wise men on the second tier down and then we've got nativity with mary joseph the baby and a few sheep on the bottom as well and you can pretty much mix and match you can do woodland scenes you can do or traditionally woodland scenes mixed in with nativity scenes would have been used but they really are magical creations we call them heirloom christmas decorations um, and on that note if you're in the us um, next year the end of august beginning of september i will be doing a masterclass on making these either single tier or three tier at the mark adams school of woodworking um, go online. Registration starts in 21 days. And I'm going to fill you all in on more of this um, next year, uh, for next year. And um, if you want to come and do a class, then, then it would be lovely to see it. But that's a Mark Adams um, school in Indiana. Um, like I say, registrations opens in 21 days. We'll put some links up as the weeks go on of, of some of these classes as well for you. But we will be making one of these and or a three-tiered version. So something to look forward to if you're over there at that time of year. So let's have a recap on last week if we can go to the close in of our carousel so last week what we've done we made the feet so down here this this the the actual base for it we've done the feet we've done the candle holders themselves we've done the actual base this the the paler section down the bottom we then done the the hollow um center uh, turning here and also the scene holder the actual um base where the the scene um, rotates on and also these side columns here okay next today what we're going to do is the actual arch we're going to then move on up we want to be able to do this hub down here so that's indexed now i have had some questions from people wanting to see how indexing works so this is perfect um, project for it we've got to do 12 positions because then we've got to um, engage our impellers and the impeller holders so these bits here, so we've got to make quite a, um, a, an accurate index for those. And then depending on how you orientate the, the impellers will depend on the speed that the, the whole thing rotates. When we, or if we have time after that, what we'll do is with a little topper that can, depending on your scene really, that can be either something bright 
um, to represent a star, or in this case, I've got a little Christmas tree there. But we'll also do maybe a couple of bits of, of the um, the scenes. I'll do a little flared Christmas tree. That's always a popular one using the skew chisel. So we'll see what time we've got. So just going to briefly put that one to one side. So I'm going to refer to that often as we go through the demonstration because we, I want to refer to sections. But if you watched last week or in episode one of this demonstration, you would have heard me mention a book. And here is here is the book. Let me get that right. So this is um, a book that I was gifted from a, a, a very well-known woodturner called Stuart King. Um, and I'm not um, fluent in German, and I can't read the, the, the German. Um, however, what I did want to show you was the inside of this book. This is a wonderful, I don't, honestly, I don't know whether it's, um, whether it's still in print. Um, I'll try and decipher some of it and put some links up if it is brilliant. Um, but let me show you a few of the pictures, a few of the imagery in it, because I often talk about inspiration. And um, inspiration for me is a, obviously really important because I want to be able to recreate things I see or put my own mark on a few things. Now, I'm going to mix, mess around with the camera just to get some of these pictures in if I can. But we're ring animals and things like that. So this is full of really, really old pictures um, of the area. It's all based around Seifen, um in eastern Germany. Some wonderful pictures of recognizable um, uh, uh, gifts that you, you will know. These Christmas trees, I know a lot of people have been talking about those recently um, on Wisdom. Um, but also, as well as the actual pictures, some wonderful artwork. And if I just start flicking through a few of these pages, you can see how bright and colourful um, the the pictures are. But for inspiration, there's, there's just reams and reams and reams of these wonderful, colourful uh, pictures of craft of that area of germany there's a lot of just regular toys what i call regular toys not regular at all but there's also a lot of christmas creations like the the well-known nutcrackers which we'll be having a go at in a few weeks light angels you may have seen me do some of those last year um and uh, and all the mythology around them as well but let's go to the back of the book i thought this was quite an interesting and apt image for today here we are so some of the the the, the intricate um uh, carousels that would have been made in that area absolutely wonderful um book for inspiration and one that um, i'm going to cherish this was like i say gifted to me from that wonderful turner um stuart king go on his website he has a, a huge um selection of videos there he's a, an historian as much as a wood turner and what he doesn't know about wood turning history then there uh, is probably not worth knowing so have a look at his website that's stuart king Okay. Yes. So we've got a, a first question. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. Great to have you with us. Um, can we see the candles lit at some stage? What I'll do, because fire in this building is not allowed. So what I'll do is I'll do a video and um, that we can post up somewhere. We'll decipher how to, and I'll let you, I'll keep you informed on that one. Um, I'll figure it out, or we'll figure it out. Someone that's got far more IT knowledge than me, can we, we can work that out for you. Yes, of course. Yes, great. And do you have plans available for the three-tier carousel? So I don't have a written plan at the moment. Um, what I do have is um, line drawings, and we might be able to get those up again in maybe maybe next week, or the, no, not next week, the week after, we might look at putting those line drawings available to you. i let you know, and I'll pop a link in. The plans to make the single tiered when I have them for sale separately on my own Etsy site, links for that is below. And some of the parts, I say some of the parts because some of you can source elsewhere um, for them are on my website. Again, there is a link below. I've also put some links in of, the, of parts that Axe to sell. So things like the uh, metal pins, um, the center pins. Now we are out of stock of those at the moment. I'm out of stock of those at the moment, but they won't be long. So be patient for those. But things like candle cups, I've got those for sale on my website. We are sourcing those as Axminster also. Um, glass bearings for the rotation, I've got those on my website. So have a look at all the links and you'll find all the parts. Email me if you're struggling with anything. 
Yes, great. Yeah, Maria, Maria's asked, um, if you have uh, read any of David Springett's books and had any inspiration from those? I have. David Springett, it, 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 certainly on my in my early days, it was a real inspiration. Very, um, very detailed. I want to say an engineer, um, engineered uh, wood turner, if you, if you know what I mean by that. Very precise. Um, I've gone a different, I've gone more Stuart King. I've gone Stuart's more um, mythology uh, type of turning, so the historical type of turning, because I like that area, particularly of Germany, um, but the, the the history that's in, in turning. So that's the side I've gone. I would say um, Jason has gone more the David Springett side with that very accurate, very precise turning. Um, I know he does talk about David quite often, yes. Yes. And Robert has just mentioned he's ordered one of your SKUs, which he should get tomorrow, and he can't wait to get using it. Excellent. Well done. Well done. Remember what I said, if the, regardless of what angle that turns up, ign ignore angles. I, I've, I've asked for these to be 25 degrees from factory. It doesn't always happen. Ignore whatever comes. Sharpen with a diamond file. Don't go to the grinder. Sharpen with a diamond file and just start using it on small pieces. If you're unsure about skew, start on, on about an inch of uh, diameter of timber. Just start planing. Once you're good with your planing cuts, then go over to rolling beads with it. But do one at a time. Don't try and get everything in at once. Remember, my uh, my learning with the skew started with a 3-8 skew and quarter-inch stock. And the, the catches which I had were so insignificant, I didn't get frightened of them, so I didn't tense up. So that's best if I start small. Yes, Craig. Yeah, Paul's asked, do you have plans for the Christmas Angels? Uh, again, same as you. I, um, give, drop me an email. Um, I don't have them uh, written up on to um, Etsy or anything like that. I do have some hard copies, though, uh, sort of just handwritten ones. So we can maybe work something out for you. All right, for the minute? Cool. I have lots of plans. You, If you've... Um, seen any of my early um from the workshop videos you all know finley fairly well as the cameraman he's my um he's my son and also does all my plans for me now between us we have written lots and lots of plans um but not not sort of uploaded a huge amount of them yet and we're working back through them to do that so there will be lots coming but um me and finn are fairly laid back and uh weeks turn into months and then years so yeah they will come yes great and just going back to your skews, uh, which size would you recommend? It's a really difficult one. If you ask me which one I like the best, it'll be the small 12 mil one. Little one. If you ask me which one I use the most, it's the largest. It's the 30 mil, 35 mil, th no, 30 mil one. So, sorry. Um, so, my favorite, my most used. All right. Um, the most used because of the size of work I do, favorite because of the balance. It's just beautiful to hold. It's a nice, a nice feel to it. Okay, let's do some. I want I was just about to say, let's do some turning. We're not turning to start with. We're going to do a bit of sanding first. So I want to make the arch. Now the arch is well, to be quite honest, any bit that isn't turned, I found a little bit taxing or worried about before I even started doing anything because you know my my strength and my workshop set up on turning. Um, so I, I really did struggle. Let's just have a, have a look at the, the arch a minute. So I made all sorts of silly mistakes at the beginning. It's the only way to improve is by making mistakes. I, I know. Um, but the, my first issue was I cut the shape out and then I tried to drill everything and trying to hold that, trying to wedge things up whilst I'm trying to drill the holes just didn't work. So I scrapped that fairly soon on. Now what I do again, are plain like most of these parts, um, I cut the material to size, then uh, thickness it, or oh, sorry, surface plane and thickness it. So it's right on that dimension. It's also correct on that dimension. And then I cut it to its width. At that point, and again, just using a template, I found easier using or doing two halves. So rather than trying to cut a template out and make it the same on both sides, if you do two halves, scribe one side, turn it over, and scribe your other side, you're going to get that far more accurate than trying to do a template to do everything at once. The center line there is for my center hole. The center hole, in turn, is to house the three mil. Uh, so it's a four mil hole, and that's to house the three mil center pin that holds the impellers at the top. On this side, 
we have our eight millimeter holes and they then support the the uprights so if i just get the finished piece over you'll see where i'm going with that <clears throat> there we are if you if you remember last week we there we are thank you last week we we made these and we put a little tenon eight mil tenon on that's where those holes are positioned here okay so that's the bottom there eight millimeters and because that's still a flat piece of timber you can use your pillar drill and um, put an upright or a fence on your pillar drill that gets positioned in the pillar drill and then you can drill both holes you can drill your four mil at the top and then turn it over and do your two eight mils you know everything is going to be aligned nicely so again no issues there um, and this in terms of this distance it has to match exactly the distance that you've drilled the holes on the base to hold your uprights in okay otherwise things are going to look sort of you know sloppy so they need to be dead upright but nice easy one to get right that one once we've done that, we're then going to cut. Now, I use the bandsaw on a majority of this, and I've done a series of lines with the bandsaw. So I cut, 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 and then I just round here with the bandsaw. You can see the sort of finish that I've got there. Fairly good, but it needs to be cleaned up. And then the same, the bandsaw on the outside. If you're going to swap your blade over for this specific job, I would go something like a quarter-inch blade um, in terms of, of width. Um, and anything from 6 to 10 T, uh, TPI, and that will give you a reasonable cut. But we will need to sand this next, and that's my first job today. Yes, Craig, another question. Yeah, just a quick one. Do you intend to do the kind of German toy rings? Um, so this that really interests me, actually. I've never had a go. I've seen people making them um, in, uh, in Seafin, and I've also been to the, the um, museum and, and seen the history of them. I've never had a go. Now, if you want to follow a, a Turner that does this brilliantly, um, Simon Begg from um, the uh, from Australia, have a look him up. Simon Begg Wood Turner, and have a look at some of his demonstrations. He's he's fairly well known out there on the circuit, but he specialises in these incredible creations. Simon Begg is his name, B E W G, I believe. Um, but a, a fantastic. I do want to have a go, and I suspect it won't be this year. But I suspect next Christmas we're going to have a go and make one together because it's come, it, those come from the circumference of the tree as opposed to a bowl blank. It takes a little bit more thought because obviously you've got top, bottoms, front, and back to to shape. Um, and so it's it, yeah, I'm really keen and interested on, on that one. Yes, Craig. And um, why don't you use a jigsaw to cut your arch shape out? You could do. Yeah, you could do. You'll be you'll be left with the same situation. You'll have to just tidy up. But yeah, scroll saw, jigsaw, bandsaw, hand coping saw, of course, if you've got no machines. Nothing stopping you from that. Um, but anything like that. My my workshop, I have um so apart from my lathe, my bandsaw's the next most used um machine apart from dust extraction of course um, bandsaw and then secondly is my um uh, planar thickener i get to use a planar fixer all the time um and those are my only three big machines in the workshop and the, the bandsaw is used constantly as a wood tool. i don't have a table saw um bench grinder is the only other other mechanical device i have so right we're going to dust extract from this and i'm going to do the external curves first and then we're going to go and do the internals so let's get some dust extraction going You've seen this before. It's my sanding table, sanding disc. It's got a little stop collar on the bottom, so we, we've got exactly our center point each time. Dust extraction's down the bottom there, doing its job. And I'm not going to go too fast. I want to keep the dust going down the pipe as opposed to up at me. And we're just going to do a little bit of tidying up. Down as far as you can go into that concave. You see a pencil line. take any flat away from the top there might be and there we are I don't need to do 
these two surfaces. They're already flat. Uh, I made sure of that on the thicknesser, so they're good. So now I'm just going to do a little bit more there. I'm not quite to my pencil line there. There we are. That looks good. Right, so now we're going to go to another type of sander. So I'm going to put a little drum sander on here. And I just like to have a selection of drum sanders um, available to me. This one fits the size nicely. It also just happens to fit in my chuck well. And then with this one, we're just going to do all the internal curves. Same thing. All I'm doing, just enough to get rid of the bouncer mark. We were talking last week about material to use and i like to use a mixture of timbers really unless i'm painting over it and if we're going to paint and put color on then i like to go with these neutral colors this particular timber here is um it's tulip so it's nice and pale and it means that you can put color on it it doesn't change the color whatever you whatever you put on top the one that i've got and, and the finished one that we showed you earlier that was painted with a gold um because we're using the gold more um as our highlights, so if I can just get that in the shot, you can see this one. So a nice plain timber to paint it that goldy color. But you can see the mixture of timbers here. I've got sapeles, tulip, we've got cedar, we've got some oak on the top, some maple. A real mixture. There are no rules at the end of the day. You can use whatever you want to. You might want to keep it all pale. You might want to keep it all one timber. Yes, Craig. Yeah, we've got a question from Colin. He has one of our trade 350 lathes. I need some advice on when to change the belt setting. But, oh, right. If, you, if you've if you ever ridden a bike or if you ride a bike, think of it that way. Or, or even drive in a car. So look at the belt settings as gears. So if you think you're riding your bike and you're pulling away up a hill, especially you're in your lowest possible gear to give you as much possible power. But you know that if you then go really, really fast, your legs are going to be going really, really fast to keep up. Um, and so that's where you need to change up. So look at the top gear, i.e. the fastest speed um, for smaller pieces. When you need much more uh, power delivered, so you're doing a big bowl, you can sacrifice speed for power. So you go down to your first gear, so the slowest possible setting. And then in between all the gears, to suit different sizes um if you're using uh, your fastest speed so your highest gear to turn big stuff all the time you're going to really put pressure on that motor and limit it um in, to the point where you're going to stop it fairly regularly so use that uh, those gearings uh, wisely to to give your your lathe a little bit of um a little bit of a breather i guess all right so lowest speed is your most powerful setting Highest, fastest speed is your. Well, its speed is is your um, is your, your your in your armory there, and it's not as powerful as your first speed. All right, so keep coming. Those sorts of questions are really important. Um, and if you're a lathe owner and you never change the lathe speed, if you're sticking with one size of project, that's no problem. But if you are like me, you're moving all over the place. You do need to change around. You won't see me move this one unless I go to big stuff. And then the minute we do that, then we we need to change the, the speed down. There we are. So that was that was fairly simple, wasn't it? And that's the, the whole emphasis of this project. We started that last week or episode one by saying this is a simple project. Each piece is an easy piece to make when you look at them individually. It's only when you put things together, then they look difficult. So there's the arch. Now, if you want to add some, um, some uh, beading on the outside edge, you want to soften some edges, you want to take a little trimming router to it, then you can. You obviously got to be careful, all those sorts of things. But that's your that's what brings everything together, your arch. Okay, moving on up. Let's go now to one of the tricky, well, trickier is not tricky, but a, a little bit of thought was put into this. This is the hub. 
So this is a, a, a started hub, obviously not finished because I need to put all the other holes around the, the outside edge. But let's look at turning one of these now. And we're going to use the indexing facility on our lathe, which I highlighted last week. Um, I just put some tape on the back where you can just see there, but we'll look at it now. Um, I highlighted this because it's a really important part for me on any lathe um, indexing. Um, so we're going to take the chuck off to start with. I've prepped the piece of timber by putting a three mil hole down through the middle of it. All right, and in this case, we're using a piece of oak. All right, so three mil hole already down through. So we're going to start by turning between centers. So single pointed tailstock center. And I'm going to start off with a ring center. Sorry, not a ring center, a pro drive this one okay that's my first one here i will swap that out in a minute i just want a little bit of power to begin with and when i swap it out i'm going to go over to again a friction drive in this case and it's a light pull drive but to start with i just need a little bit of power that that pro drive is going to give me because i want to turn this really quite hard piece of material down to round first so we'll go down to round I want to be fairly quick. So let's go 2,000 revs, quarter inch bowl gouge. And we're just rough down. Rough down to a cylinder first. There we are. So we're down to cylinder, look. So we're nice and round. Next thing, I'm going to do the rough shape. Little bit more from here. Okay, I'm not going to do anything more to that just yet. So, what we're doing now, we're going to stop. And this is my preferred way of doing this. So, you might decide that you want to do it slightly differently. But now I'm going to take that off. I'm going to add the friction drive. Because sometimes when you swap centers, what you might find is things stray a little bit. So you might find a, just a little bit of flicker. So now I've got most of that bolt gone. I'll shove it, that one on there. It's lovely, brilliant. So all I'm gonna do is tidy up the last little bit. And I want to clean up both of these edges now. So let's go and shape that side. Now I can afford to shape that because that is just going to straight onto the pin. It's not going to butt joint onto anything. This, however, is going to butt joint on because I'm going to have a little capping finial. A little capping finial on the top of that one. Or in the case of the one that I showed you earlier, it was a little Christmas tree. So that needs to be flat. Okay, my next job is I'm going to just put a little center line on there. This is the flat area that we are now going to drill and get our holes in. So you can see a center line on that one already. Yes, Craig. Yeah, Andrew's asked, if um, you don't have a quarter inch bowl gouge, um, will a 3 8 do instead? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it will do. Or or maybe go for a spindle gouge if you don't have the bowl gouge. But, yeah, no problem at all. You, you, obviously, it's just a much bigger chisel, much bigger gouge, so you might find it a little bit clunky on some of these smaller pieces. Um, but, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, go for it. Um, like I say, spindle gouge if, if you're struggling with access. But, yeah, you should be all right. 
we're going to drill. So I'm going to use the indexing. I'm going to first um, get myself into an index position. The indexing for my lathe is behind here. You won't see it, um, but it's to the just to the back of my headstock. I'm just going to find that first position. And look, I've already written, written, I've drew um, some pencil lines and a pencil mark up here. So I've got a good quick idea of where all my lines are. Um, just to make it easier for you to see. So my line up here, matching here. I'm going to do four or five holes for you. I'm not going to make you sit through everything. And my drill, um, drill jig is here. So it's a fairly simple piece of kit. I've just, this is a piece of hard oak. Um, this is the hole. It's a five millimeter hole I'm using. Um, and this isn't a hole. This is just where my, 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 um, my locking lever is grabbing. It's very simple. When that one wears, make another one. So nothing expensive. We need to make sure that it's aligned, though. So I'm just going to get the drill bit. A lip and spur is really useful for this. If we don't use a lip and spur, you can get a skidding um, motion from a lot of twist drills. So a lip and spur will give you your crispest, crispest, crispest um, finish and cleanest entry to the hole. I'm just aligning center point up. I want to make sure on the vertical that my um, my jig is set correctly. The next thing, I want to make sure I'm aligned with the, the line. I'm going to come back a little bit, align everything up, make sure I'm going to drill an actual straight hole. There we go. And whilst I'm there, I'm just going to put a little bit of tape on the outside of that drill bit so I go the same depth each time. And to be honest, you know, you don't need to go too deep. I would, su I suppose 10 mils enough. There we are. That'll do us. So now each hole I'm going to drill in the same place. I'm going to line up my line. That's going straight into my, my cordless. Okay. And we can do the, let's do four or five of those holes. Yes, great. Yeah, Maria's asked, um, she notices that the light pull drive is only available in uh, two more taper. Uh, going back to the certain episodes with Jason and his quest for one more taper, is he getting anywhere, do you think? I think he's conversations have been had. He's certainly making enough noise about it. Most so he's, 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 he's put the fight out there. Um, uh, I don't know. I'm going to let Jason answer those questions for you um, when he's demonstrating next. But at the moment, he's, he's carrying the banner for the one more taper. See, my shoulders really slope down then. Okay, let's start drilling our first hole. So we're all locked up. I'm going to line up with the center line. And I'm going to go up to my tape. I'm going to take the indexing down to the next position. Do the same thing again. Line up with the tape. Or we'll drill into the tape. Next position. When you've got this down, you, you're, you've done this a few times, the, the indexing is a very simple part of the process. Um, to start with, it can be fairly complicated. Just to think about, but it's, it is a fairly simple process. This particular lay is divided up into 36 positions. I'm only using 12 of them. And we'll do, let's do one more. Take off the indexing so you can see what we're getting. We're getting that nicely spaced series of index holes. I remember I've divided 12 positions here. So if your lathe has 48, 36, 24, whatever, you just need to work out where your 12 positions are. And just by drawing that has made it so much easier for me not messing around too much. Yes, Craig. Jim B's asked if you can have another close look at your uh, drum sander, please. 
Um, she, he's asked if we sell it. I've got Lindsay putting up a link in the chat for uh, our version of that. Yeah. Excellent. There we are. So, yeah, just a very simple drum sounder. This one, I quite like this one because you can use normal paper. You don't have to buy a specific strip um, that's made for the drum itself. You just cut your own abrasive to suit this um because it, it's just paper and then there's a little oval um a oval pin that locks it in position so it's quite a nice one for me and these i've, I've got these in a few sizes as well and it's quite important if you know, you're not never always going to make the same size project so to have a drum sander of different sizes is really useful i know <coughs> i know we sell a particular kit um and in a little gray box which is uh, which is smaller drums but they again are used all the time really really useful there we are so Look, we were already done the the arch. We've done the hub. So, like I say, really, you know, I, I outthought it too much. Really, I overthought it and created a problem where there wasn't one. Um, but that really is a fairly simple bit to, to make and gets you using the indexing on the lathe. Okay, and again, invaluable having something um, like this, which is just a piece of hard oak um, with a hole in it to give me my drilling point was a really useful bit of kit. Um, I have made a few, I've probably made about, I've got about four on the go at the moment with different drill hole sizes, that's all. Uh, yes, Craig. Uh, Paul's asked, are you locking in on each turn or is there a special way of doing it differently? No, I'm locking in on each turn. So every time you don't see, because it's on the this part of the lathe back here, Every time I get to that point, I'm screwing the little lock into the index position, and then that's solid. That won't move anywhere then. Then I undo that one, move to the next position, lock it in again, and so on. Okay, so again, there's no movement there at all. All right, so yeah, it's in, it is important. Most slaves have it. Some of the lower-end ones, the cheaper ones, won't. They'll have, they'll have spindle locks, but they won't have indexing. Um, but most machines do. Most full-size machines will have a spindle lock and a and an index. Don't get them confused. You never want to use your indexing pin to lock the lathe to take a chuck off or something like that because you'll snap it. It's only a tiny pin. So what we're doing next? We're going to do the um, the holders. Now let's just have a quick look here at a couple of impellers and impeller holders. So these are a couple of shapes. You can either. Go for solid timber. This is a lovely piece of cedar. And thickness down to the right thickness. This is, is uh, as, as thin as my thickness would go. So I get pieces like that. Again, from long strips and then cut them to length. That, in turn, was that was three millimeters. So really quite thin. And then sanded and, and blended over. Or alternatively, you go for birch or any, any timber ply. I say any timber. Birch-faced, tulip um, or poplar-faced, oak-faced maple face anything like that it's becoming quite expensive but you can still get it especially in the craft market at thin thicknesses like this three mil and then you can make as many impellers as you want to you got plenty of thickness no problem um make your own and then here's just a couple of ideas for shapes here you see and again cardboard templates work really really well um, you can make as many as you want to. These are the impellers. We're going to make one for you in a second. But the bit that I'm looking at first, before we do the impellers themselves, are the impeller holders. So it's these fellas here. And they are a very simple shape. Again, overthought it a little bit. Um, I wondered how I was going to get a slot in accurately. And, of course, I didn't do it after turning. I've done it before. So this particular blank is ready to do two impeller holders, one on each side. Um, and I used the band, so I, I just adjusted the fence so I could cut one direction, turn him over, and cut the other, and that opened up the slot big enough for me to get in my um, my piece of timber there. And I can, of course, create a little stop so you cut the same depth on each time. And I just cut several of these at, at once, um, and uh, so I've got loads and loads there ready to turn into impeller holders. We do that right away, so I'm going to use a chuck for this. Now, there's all sorts of jaws you can use to hold small pieces you've seen me use um step jaws in the past but as these are preloaded on my chuck i'm going to use these these are o'donnell jaws and these are the od ones od one inch and they're going to grip that beautifully look don't worry about the the gap that's in the middle i'm going to show you the shape and we do a little bit of cleaning up afterwards but just enough to get rid of the burrs 
which there never are that many. Scooters, obviously. <laughs> this is definitely the realms of the scoot. So fairly rapid, fairly quick. I'll tell you exactly how fast. It's going to be around about 2,000 revs. There we are, 2,000 revs. Little 12 mil skew. We'll tidy up first before I carry on. Yes, Craig. Yeah, we've got a quick question about grinders, CBN grinders. Um, Callum says he's got a craft grinder but wants to have two CBN wheels, one each end. Which trade grinder would you recommend for Callum? So the um, oh, well, I'm using the slow speed trade grinder, the um, the eight inch, and I've actually got two CBN wheels on the on that one. It works beautifully, really, really smooth, um, and that would definitely be my recommendation. So, Craig, remind me of its its um its name. Is the is it the SRG slow running grinder, AT SRG Axminster Tools slow running grinder. I'll get the link. Um, Two hundred, I think. Yeah, yeah, I'll get the yeah link. we're gonna get the link put up for you, Callum. Um, but this is my go-to. Again, if you've seen some of the videos or go back and look at some of the videos from the workshop, you'll see um, that we've got that one in there. At that point, I only had one of the the, um, uh, the CBM wheels on it. I've now got two um, coupled up with my tech jigs and all those sorts of things. My, my, my go-to sharpening, that is it's the best for me. There we are. So we're going to just clean this up to a cylinder. There we are. So we're down to around. Now, just need to clean up the outside edge. You can put a very slight convex curve on there if you wish. Just so it's all finished. Now, if I just pop a pencil line, that's where the slot ends there. So I'm going to give myself a little bit of a landing there. And then at that point, we're going to make our tenon. So I need to gauge the tenon by the drill bit we've used, which is 5 mil, if you remember. My tape's in the way. Let me take my tape off. And then we'll just do a little measurement. So, five mil. Tiny, tiny little tenon. And because it's tiny, we're going to use a small six mil feeding and parting tool rather than a very big tool. So uh, my tenon, I'm going to come down there, I want my tenon here. There we are, tenon. And now we're going to go to a spindle gouge. I find the spindle gouge for this sort of thing really useful because it's a, the perfect combination between gouge and skew. Bowl gouge is just too clunky for that, where the the spindle gouge works beautifully. There we are. Not a huge amount left to do on that, apart from a little bit of sanding. Let's just give it a sand, actually. A little bit of abrasive on there. Well, we're not going to go crazy with abrasive. Um, if I just go 240. There we are. And then once you've done that, if you just run the abrasive down through the slot, it is fairly clean, but just to create, just to get rid of any burrs that may be inside. But it's surprising. I, th I was expecting it to, to all go wrong when I started turning these. Um, and they actually work quite well. They hold together. The, the timber I'm using is maple. That's the other reason, of course. If you have a timber with a heavy grain, then you probably won't be quite as lucky. Um, but something like maple, um, a, a decent sycamore, hard sycamore would work well, but any hard timber with, without too much of an open grain is the best thing. Um, we'll now use the skew just to part that one away. Just support with your fingers, watch your wrists, anything that's over here overhanging the chuck, just be careful. And we're just going to part off. There we are. And then when we've made the, the impeller, okay, we can then pop that inside, glue him on, and we're away. Okay, so nice and 
Nice and simple. The the only thing I would say about the impellers and the impeller holders, of course, is there are 12 of them to make. And if you're making any more than one carousel, then you've got a lot of uh, impeller and impeller holders to do. So what I would do now is turn that over. We'd hold the same. We'd do number two impeller holder um, on there. Okay, so put that back in the lathe and do number two. Yes, Greg. I've got a question from Paul, but it's a question for myself, Colin, if that's okay. Um, a question about the dovetail jig and fingers. Paul, it really does depend which uh, dovetail jig you've got, whether it's an old Axminster or an old UJK. So could you just um, drop us an email at woodworkingwisdom at axminstertools.com and we can answer your question that way. Thank you very much. And Colwyn, while he's on, Frederick says, thanks for the advice on the, uh, advice on the reactive paints. It's good stuff. He did send a picture for info. I right. think, think yeah. we've seen that picture, yeah. yeah. yeah we've had a look this afternoon. Well done. Uh, Tom's asked as well, um, does he just need – he's bought a Colwyn Way Signature Skew. Happy days. Well done, Tom. Um, does he need to grind, or is he just okay with a diamond card on it? Diamond card, diamond card. The only time grind you need to grind is if it's you've had it a few months, years, um, and that – the, the the bevel is starting to to sort of misshape get it back to its sort of original um uh, original grind which i i i try and get around about 25 degrees single angle so single side 55 degrees overall bevel angle sorry 50 degrees overall bevel angles but uh, 25 degree each side so if you're measuring um and then from then on just diamond sharpen um occasionally i'll take it to the honing wheel so a little leather strop just to um put a, a fresh edge but most of the time it's it's like that i've done that ever since i've been using skew chisels and i've got a carbon steel skew which is a little bit shorter than that but that's been with me over 30 years now um because i've just used that diamond card you know these don't need heavy grinding it's not like a bowl gouge or roughing gouge all those sorts of things um just constant honing or, or diamond fire will do the job yeah Probably not good for the tool companies out there that are trying to sell tools, but that's it. that's the, the honest truth. Okay, so lace speed is zero, of course, because now I'm adding the, the sanding disc again. And what we're going to do now is just sand one of these one of these little impellers. So I've got the two styles there. I've got a rounded over one, and I've got this that flat grind, I the flat curve. I prefer this one. If I'm honest with you, I prefer this one. It gives you more. Um, size to the impeller we're going to go with that one and turn the machine on get some dust extraction flowing the speed i'm sanding at you know that's going to differ to, for, for a job and for grit size but this is um running at 900 at the moment let's just take some of that mess off the back Once you've done that, let me just turn the, the lathe off in a moment. Once you've done that, just feather the edges. So at the moment, that's a square piece. And we're just softening everything. And then just a little bit of hand sanding with some abrasive just to make that really neat and tidy. And then your impeller holder, wherever it's gone. And then slot in. I did say last week that most pieces I try not to glue. So after the Christmas period, you can dismantle these. However, these can be glued together. They can come away as one part. It doesn't matter. And then you can just push them into the hub and out when you when you want to take them apart. Right, well, we're getting there. So a couple of things I want to do now. I'm just going to do a little topper. Um, and I'll get the finished piece over so you can see what I'm talking about. And then I want to do one of the little flared Christmas trees for you. So let me just grab 
the finished one, just while we're answering a few questions. So the topper I want to make is this. And this one's a little Christmas tree, but you can do finials. You can do anything you want to um, to top the, the carousel off. Yes, Craig. Mike's got a question. Talking about diamond cards and sharpening, how long should a diamond card last? He's got one of the DMT ones. One of the DMT ones. Well, it's really... <laughs> So almost an impossible question to answer. Um, I can give you what I've, how long mine lasts. So I've got, um, I've got, this is my Axminster one. I've got a DMT one that I use here, and I've got um, a trend one at home. My trend one lasted me because it's at home and I use it every day. Probably lasted about two years. This one, this is uh, one of the Axminster Diefold ones. This one has lasted probably about four years. It's been quite a long while with this one. And similarly with this one, this has been even longer, about five years, this diamond card. Um, that one's fine. This one's coarse and medium. My one at home is a, um, is a medium and fine. So there's a real mixture there, really. Um, it depends how often you're using them. If you're using them every day, they can be down to just a couple of years. Um, but it's seldom used, and they'll they'll push on for years and years and years. All right. If you get them wet, if you use them wet, make sure you dry them afterwards. That's another thing. The diamond won't wear, of course, but the diamond will come off as the back starts to rot away. So make sure you dry things well afterwards. That's the other thing. There we are. Right, then. so toppers. So that's, that's the kitty that we make. Let's make – I won't make one of those because we're going to do a Christmas tree in a minute. Let's just do a little finial. It's going to go flat on the on the top of the hub, and we'll use the hub we just made as the as the dummy. Um, and let's go – how are we going to hold this in the lathe? What jaws have I got? It's always a set of jaws that will work. Let me see how close – these go so i've just used the od ones are oh, they're perfect um let's go for the od 112s you would have seen me use these an awful lot especially on the well we haven't done the smokers yet they're going to be coming in december but um and i use those a lot on the smokers but um it's a little topper we'll just do a little finial Look at that. They're just going to go straight inside. Let's give myself a little bit of space. Again, this is maple. I'm going to use a nice small tool rest so I can get nice and close. And that, at the moment, that timber is far too big, so we'll take them down firstly. Making sure everything's safe and locked. Chuck is nice and tight, we know that. So lace with the zero, turn the lathe on. We we'll use a bowl gouge first. I'm not going to use a roughing gouge, it's just too big. It's going to probably throw it out the chuck if I do that. <laughs> so I'm going to go with a small bowl gouge to rough down to cylinder. There we go. So now what I want to do is just measure top of the hub. This is going to be a diameter. We're going to turn this to meet. That's good. So, right, I'm going to go a little, little bit bigger, and we're going to roll over, turn it into a bead. So beading and parting tool. There we are. So we got a diameter. Well, our diameter's almost there. It's not quite right at the moment. Um, I'll use that bowl gouge again just to take a little bit more of the diameter away. But look at the cut that I'm using. I'm using this as a skew at the moment. I'm not using it as a gouge. And basically all that means is I'm dropping the, the bottom wing and giving a 45 degree cut using the bevel to rub. There we are. So we've got our diameter. We go back to our skew. I'm going to clean up. So whatever happens now, I've got the diameter right. A 
and I'm just making stuff up now. There we are. Let's go spindle gouge. Making stuff up in terms of shape, of course. I've got enough rough idea, but... Parting tool, a true parting tool, so a one eighth parting tool, drop the tool rest down. Let's take that a little bit thinner. That's better. It's a little clunky then for a minute. So again, you sand this now. You can embellish this if you want to. So you want to put some, use a decorating elf maybe. You want to use some colored waxes, some paints, that sort of stuff. Go for it. Absolutely no problem. But then you're going to pass off. Don't worry about a tenon. And it just so happens, you will always have a little bit of waste left when you're parting off like this. But that little bit of waste, conveniently, will slot into the hole that we've still got at the top. And if I pop that there, one thing I didn't do is round over the edge, and I said I was going to bead this, and because of that, there's a bit of an overhang. But that slot there, that hole, that bit of waste fits in there. You can put use your epoxy. And that is now the cap. So when the center pin, your main center pin goes through, it's going to stop... There we are at that cap once you've glued that in. So it stops everything from falling down. So it's quite a quite an important part of the build. Really, really important that bit. We'll put it into context. Let me get me the finish one over again just to show you where that is. And then we're going to do one flared tree. And then I'm going to leave it to you guys to build your carousels. So there's our topper. That's the job it's doing. It's stopping this center pin, okay, from going all the way through and this whole section there falling down onto the arch that's its job okay right one flared tree a little bit of fun just to demonstrate before we go and again very very um, much a german tradition these you'll see these being made online now um, on videos online on youtube and these are decorating all manner of german Christmas decorations. Great skew chisel practice. And if you ever get to demonstrate at country fairs, craft shows, that sort of thing, these are ideal because you can make these fairly quickly and hand them out to people as they walk by. Uh, really, really quite quick to make. Yes, great. Yeah, comment from Callum. Um, he said he did enjoy my two demos, so thanks very much, Callum. He says, oh, looks like I've got a dry sense of humour. And he goes on to say, oh, mate, you have no idea. Um, <laughs> he goes on to say, we must have a laugh when we're working together. Well, yeah, I think that's fact. That's a given, isn't it? Enjoying yourself, enjoying I, what I, you do. I think it's we have to, don't we? Absolutely. It is It is a bit of a giggle. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's an old saying that... Um, um, you know, if you enjoy what you do, you'd never work a day in your life. It's pretty much like that here. Mm. Um, we're, we're, we, we're basically getting paid to show off in front of you guys, have a, g a giggle while we do it, and make stuff. So it, we're very lucky people, very lucky people. Even the Grinch laughs sometimes, you see. Right, let's, uh, let's quick. <laughs> I'm not saying anything. <laughs> Quiet. We'll quickly rough this down. Scoot chisel. To, for roughing down, the skew chisel can be used like that. Or you can use it flat. All I would say, if you're going to use it flat, make sure you're absolutely bang on with your, your holding. Great way to create tenons as well.
So we're already down to a cylinder. I have done these trees for you before, you know. You would have seen me do these many times, mainly on, on explaining the use of a skew. Let's go. I'm going to go slightly smaller on skew now. I'm just going to make a nice little curved cone shape, really. There we are. So we're going to start there. The bottom of the tree is going to be there. And then we're going to create a nice little uh, base for the tree as well. But now I'm going to turn the lace speed down around about 12 to 1400 revs. And we're going to start doing a series of push cuts using the heel of the skew. Just push, 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 push. And what we're doing, and I'll stop the lace just to show you what we're getting here. We're getting a little curl. Okay, a curl on the timber. You can't use every timber. Open fibrous timbers won't work. But things like this, things like birch are fantastic. Lime are great. You know, all those types of timber. Then we'll do another one. Push the fiber back. Push the fiber back. So you can see it's just the heel of the skew is the bit that's working. I'm not using a planing cut in any way, just the heel. Once you've done that, well, again, we'll stop and show you before we finish it off. We're going to do a little bit of airbrushing on this to get some color into it. Yes, Craig. Steve has asked, any chance you could demonstrate turning a mushroom? You'd have to use a chisel and not use a mushroom. I mean, a turn, real mushroom. Turn, oh, turning right, a mushroom, okay. not turning okay, with a mushroom. Well done. <laughs> uh, yes of course we can we'll do one it won't be today um but let's do one i'm i'm christmas up up until the end of december so we'll look toward january february and we'll put it in our to-do list of demos yeah no problem at all no problem but mind you i have seen on um again on youtube when we when we look through turning demonstrations, we have seen, haven't we, Craig, uh, melons and um, uh, pumpkins and all sorts being turned on the lathe. Yeah, it's messy. Um, quite unusual, quite messy. messy. So, Spindle gals, look, we're just going to create that underside, same way we did this with the topper. And then we'll get a little bit of color on. There we are. It doesn't matter. The underside is a little bit messy because the top is. It, it makes no difference because we're not trying to make a, cr a clean piece. There we are. Let's add a little bit of colour. So we'll go with a nice little green. Um, you can use paint pens on this. However, You'll only get to the outside of the the little frills that you're um, you're trying to paint because because obviously the paint pen can't get right down into all of those little frills. So we're going to go with a little olive green. I've got my pens down here. Um, olive green. That's the one. Lay speed on, or lay it on, sorry. We're going to start nice and close to the underside first.
There we are. What should we do on the base? Let's let's put a little red base on. So I've got a coral red here somewhere. Coral red. There it is. But, you know, you can come up with your own colours here. Red and green just tends to go well together. The closer you are with an airbrush, the fine the point's going to be. That's why you see me getting quite so close. And the other beautiful thing with airbrushing is that paint's now dry. I don't have to worry. I can part it straight off and we're done. So let's stop the blade, show you what that looks like. It just finishes the piece off and those thrills really get enhanced with a bit of colour. So parting tool. Be careful, don't grip this now. Um, if you do, you're going to take all those thrills away. So if I just part this off, and we've got a few questions mounting up, I think. So let me part this off. I'll stop the lane and then we'll take your questions. So there we are. Just It'll pop off nice and gentle. And we've got our little little Christmas tree. Nice little gifts, those as well. Groups, different sizes, groups of three or five um, in a little bag for Christmas to put on the side is uh, is a nice little present. Yes, Craig. Uh, Paul's asked, are you going to do the Christmas decoration, the, the collaboration with Ben that we were going to do on the course back in the day? Oh, yeah. we uh, Remember that one? So, yeah, that was the, um, that was the candle arch. And so... In a way, yes, we are, um, and I don't have the date on me at the moment. But yeah, we're going to work on that one. Um, Ben's having um, a much bigger role in that because it's going to be far more um, a scroll saw project. I should be doing a few more of these things and, and little snowmen, that sort of stuff to decorate the bottom. But there's going to be a lot of scroll sawing on that one. However. Craig Steele is going to be doing an, an, another version. So that's in the next few couple of weeks, I believe. Next week. Next week. It's there Christmas. We are. So Candle, I'm, I'm not going to give too much away, but no, you no. are working on that, aren't you? Yes. Yeah, yeah, it'll happen next week. Next week. Yeah. Um, yes. Another question from Maria. Is that spirit stain you're using there? They are spirit stains. That, but those particular ones are the Chromacraft range that um, uh, that I'm champion, championing at the moment. Um, really nice sort of colours on those. That particular one was an olive green and then the coral red. Yes. All right. But spirit stains are my favourite. They're my go-to in an airbrush because I can leave them in there for months and I don't have to clean them up. If you go acrylics, you tend to have to clean up pretty much after every use. Um, so that's my not my go-to. All right. Is that it for the minute? Look, thank you ever so much, everybody. Now, I just want to mention about next week. Um, next week for me, we've got, obviously there's other demos this week, but I just want to mention um, something that's happening on the Tuesday of next week. And we're linking up with a very good friend of ours, uh, Nick Agar, uh, over in the States. So it's going to be our first collaboration between two workshops and that's happening next Tuesday, same time, uh, and same place. Um, don't worry. We will start here before we go off to Nick and we're going to look at some of the Chromacraft products and um and we'll do a demonstration piece for you i'll do half the piece he'll do the other half so that's quite an exciting one uh fingers crossed everything uh, goes well and the bugs don't come out but yeah we're really excited about that one in the meantime though craig remind everybody of what you're doing tomorrow tomorrow what we've got going out we've got actually as a guide to drill bits so many woodworking drill bits brad point flat bits lip and spurs forstner bits and it's a guide to using the right bit for the right job. And then on, on oh, we've got another turning on Thursday, haven't we? We've got, um, is it Jason doing his carved bowl? Ah, yeah, it's adding decoration to the rim of your bowl uh, via carving and different methods of, of carving as well. So that's going to be cool. Excellent, excellent. Well, look, thank you ever so much, everybody, for stopping by. I hope you've enjoyed that one. There are bound to be lots of questions on it. Um, Keep, just look back through the videos as well, but email us if you have any burning questions. There are several links below um, for various parts, bits and bobs, those sorts of things. But like I say, thank you very much. If you like what you see, thumbs up, subscribe and share, you know, the usual things. But until next time, thank you very much and bye-bye.